Welcome to Perspectives with Asima Silva. Uh, today we have a very interesting show. I have Sarah Minerka from um, from a, a blind, a blind into integration, empower with integration, em empower through em empowerment through integration that deals with helping out people who have disabilities. Um, and we had previously, uh, when I was doing this radio show, uh, perspectives on. Uh, this is taped at WCCA TV, but on WCRN, when I was doing the radio show, we had Sarah on before and talked about some of her work. Uh, we're going to go over it a little bit more so that all our audience is up to date and caught up. Um, but I wanted to invite her again today to talk about some of the success stories and some of the new developments that she's done with her organization. So thank you, Sarah, for joining us again. Um, and I hope that, you know, I know you came all the way down to downtown Worcester to talk to us. And I know you are so busy with your organization and the work you do. But could you please tell us a little bit, empowerment through integration, what exactly is that? Yes, definitely. Well, first of all, Asma, thank you so much for inviting me back and um, for giving us here the space to kind of talk more about empowerment through integration. I also want to thank my colleague, Lauren, who came with me um, down to Worcester. So, so yeah, ETI, Empowerment Integration, it's a nonprofit organization that I founded a few years ago um, uh, based on my own personal narrative surrounding my own disability. So what we focus on is changing the narrative, changing the narrative surrounding disability, getting society to believe that the inclusion of all is a value for all. So we want to really work on the one hand, the societal level, how can we tackle the stigma? How we, can we get individuals in society to believe that we need to integrate people with disabilities. We need to make sure we tap into their own potential. When we don't, we lose out. So that's one angle of our, of our approach. The other angle is actually also working with individuals with disabilities, people with disabilities, to really embrace all of who they are, to embrace their disability identity, to see the strength behind their own disability, and to say, I have something beautiful to contribute. So that's kind of the overarching mission of ETI. Um, it started off based on my own experience as someone who's blind. I was born and raised here in the US. My parents are originally from Lebanon. And um, I grew up straddling two different types of um, worlds and experiences. One world where I was fully supported, empowered, and valued, and I was able to live my life very normally, very fully, very um, inclusive, and it's because I was really pushed to tap into my potential. But another world um, where um, I was, people saw my disability as something to be ashamed of, or something to be fixed, or charity, or burden, and it used to really disempower me and get to me, and I used to think to myself, imagine living that narrative my whole life. I wouldn't be where I am right now. And unfortunately, most people with disabilities, most kids with disabilities across the globe, even parts here in the US, are living that disempowerment, that charity pitying narrative. So ATI was summed out of, let's change that narrative, let's tackle that stigma on both individual level and societal level. You touched on my next question, um, where you said, this problem exists in certain parts of the United States. Yes. Uh, hard to believe when we have so many disability laws and protection yes. for people who deal with disabilities. Uh, I know before we get into all the work that you've done in different countries, which parts of the United States are struggling and how? Um, it's across the border and it's, it's because, yes, we do have federal laws, we do have the ADA, we do have policies that protect certain rights of people with disabilities. And even on a federal level, there's still that risk of, of those laws being um, removed or changed because they're not seen as valuable. Yes, we do have that, but it also goes state by state, and it goes town by town. And I was privileged to be born, to be raised in a town where it had the resources to support, to really integrate and include me. Right? It had teachers that were willing to really, were wanted to include me. And I, I always say it goes back to individuals. You know, you have policies, and that's great. But who enforces the policies? Who implements the policies? It's the people. And only when we get to a point where people believe and value the policies, that's when true change is going to happen. And unfortunately, there's so many parents that don't know their rights, so many individuals with disabilities that don't know their rights, and they're getting marginalized and they're getting um, pushed aside. So it's across the board, even here in parts in the U.S. And, I mean, in Massachusetts. Do you deal with mostly um, younger children uh, with disabilities or mostly adults? And, and the reason why I'm asking yes. that is oh, you're talking about integration. Yes. Um, and I, you know, I, for some reason, have assumed that that integration meant in schools mm -hmm. at a young age. But what about integration in workforces, in fields that may, you know, not necessarily attract people, with, or not attract, but encourage people with disabilities? It's a, it's a really good question. So um, our, our model is two-pronged approach, two approach. So one, one 
um, one angle is we do work with kids with disabilities, but this is more in the developing world. So we work with the kids, with the parents and the communities, and we have a cycle of six programs surrounding empowerment and inclusion. And we do focus on all aspects of getting a kid from complete social isolation to complete social inclusion. So we really focus on building their life skills, integrating them, and also getting them to participate in community service projects. So we even get them to a point where they're contributing to their society. So that's more in the international realm. In the U.S., um, there's a lot of organizations working on, you know, workplace development or workforce development um, for people with disabilities and education and that kind of stuff. We are entering the, the field in a different angle. We're actually in the U.S. working with corporations, government spaces, nonprofit, and universities to have to change their perspective surrounding certain labels and certain isms that they have surrounding people's potential. So we actually work, for instance, we come to a company and we do these in the dark training and getting participants to really reflect on what are the isms that really they embody preventing them from tapping into their colleagues' full potential. A big part of it is ableism, a big part of other types of isms. So we really target more on the societal level and changing the narrative in society. Well, society you're level. talking about working with companies. Yes. And when most people apply for companies, they usually get this wonderful form that they're asked to fill out, yes. right? And part of those questions, it's listed as optional, yes. but they're asked if they have a disability, yes. and they're asked what kind of disability. Yes. Um, or they've, uh, they've been asked if they've had cancer or like yes. any sort of medical condition and what kind of medical condition. Yes. And of course, it's listed as optional. Yeah. But really, if someone wanted to be truthful and wrote down their disability or wrote, wrote yeah, down their they're medical gonna condition. Aside. You know, they're not going to exactly. Yeah, I mean, I mean it, it, it is a way of discrimination. I am actually, I'm actually against that. And I think that, um, after, yes, having a disability, you should ask for accommodation later on. And you should be, um, I think a person should be forward with their own disability. But unfortunately, HR managers and when people are hiring, they do discriminate, whether they know it or not. And if you have someone with a disability or someone without a disability with the same background, same skill set, same whatever, but they see that one has a disability, they're going to pick the person without a disability. Because right. automatically they're going to say that that person is going to be less of a burden and less of a hassle. Right. And what we're trying to say is that, look at, you're looking at potential in a very um, linear way, in a very, um, in a wrong way, right? Just because this person doesn't have a disability or this person has a disability, you're seeing their disability as a negative thing. Why don't you look at it from a different angle and see it as a strength? Because, for instance, someone that has been living with their disability their whole life, they are more resilient, they're more creative, they're more innovative. They have so many strengths that employees don't see, don't see, don't, uh, employers don't see. So we're trying to get corporations and other entities to say, when you hire someone with a disability, don't hire them because you have to, hire them because you want to, and you see the strength and the beauty in that. So, so do, I don't know if you have these statistics, but when I said, you know, those forms are optional, and some people actually want to say, you know, they're honest and they say, no, yeah. I don't have a disability. Some people don't want to talk about their yeah. disability because they know they could potentially be discriminated. Yes. And some people write down, I don't want to answer as yes. more of a, maybe a polit political stand or maybe yeah. of a stand of saying, I don't like this kind of form and yeah. these kind of questions. Do we know what kind of, depending upon what answers we give, how discriminatory our, our applications become? I mean, that's, I don't have an answer, and I don't know if there's a statistics or um, a research done on that, but to be honest, it's probably really hard to even know because a big part of it is probably unconscious bias as well. Like, even, like, you can't really, to a point, you might not, HR managers, they might not be doing it intentionally either. They, not be, might, they might not be um, putting out this bias in, a, in, a, in an explicit way, so we never know, so I, don't, I really don't know what that is. Because some people is. might yeah. say, well, if you're going to list it, they have a quota to fill, and you might just fill that quota, right? And some people might look at that as an advantage rather than a disadvantage. I don't know, but yeah, I'm just saying it's... but that quota is it's so small. It's like a three... Yeah, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's true, but to be honest, most... And I've seen this, and people have said it, if, if you do have two applicants, they're pretty much the same in all levels, but one has a disability, one doesn't. It's usually people usually go without the disability, um, but I don't. I don't have that. I, right. I, I but how that. do you find it in terms of schools? You're talking about. You said we, you work with companies, <clears> but <throat> you also work with maybe teachers, administrators, or counselors. Yes. And yes. so, do do you find them more receptive to your message and to what you're trying to do? Um, 
Yes, and actually, so right now with s schools and universities, we've been working with student populations um, most, um, more than faculty. We are trying to move towards faculty because I've had experiences in the past where uh, teachers are a professor, that had a professor that didn't want me in his class. And he didn't think I would actually pass his class, a math professor. So um, I think there needs, there's so much work to be done on that level. But the, right now we're focusing on students. And the whole purpose of these students is to kind of really, how can students create a space where it allows for each person to be comfortable being their true authentic self? So we're trying to get every single person on one hand to be comfortable embracing all of who they are and bringing out all of who they are to this space. And on the other hand, getting individuals not to judge others or create assumptions of others and not to kind of, because ultimately when we go into a university space and we're in a classroom setting, we tend to gravitate towards people that are like us. Right. And we don't go towards people that are different from us. And that prevents us from really, again, tapping into each other's amazing um, beauty and asset that we can provide. So we are trying, and the whole, how this connects to disability is that, um, unfortunately, a person without a disability, A, it probably does not usually feel welcomed, or they don't feel like they belong in that kind of space. They feel like they're either marginalized, they feel like their voice is not included, they feel mm -hmm. like they're different, and we're trying to get them, like, no, like, you're part of this, and there's a beauty behind it. Um, we were talking to the... Uh, an administration at the Ed School at Harvard, and she was saying that we, they, she has students where they would come into the disability office services and they're, they're kind of scared of asking for accommodations because they don't want their peers to know that they have a disability and they need accommodations. So there's still a lot of shame around that, and we're trying to say we need to break, break down those stigmas. In this, yeah. So with all your work, um, you've been recognized you were named 40 Under 40 by Forbes. Um, and when I found that out, I was like, wow, she's in, she's in our, you know, our backyard. I need to have her on our show. Like, this is a great, you know, this is a great accomplishment and a great honor. Uh, Want to talk to us about and let us know how did you accomplish this kind of achievement? And I know you also had some funding from the Clinton Foundation. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, yes, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, until now, I'm, I'm honored and um, blessed to have been on the Forbes 30 on the 30 and many other, the Clinton Award and others. Um, to be honest, it's, it's not me, and I, it's more the people that have supported me and the cause. And it started off with my family, my parents, um, my, uh, my mother, my siblings, my friends, my classmates, um, my professors. And then later on, it became my, my group of volunteers, my team. And now it's my amazing staff and, and advisors. And so it's this support system that really works around this mission. And everyone believes in this mission. Like our team is now comprised of, it's a diverse group of um, individuals. A lot of them, are, most of them are women from diverse backgrounds and perspectives. And, and they're passionate because ultimately ETI is focusing on inclusion. And even if they don't have a disability, they still connect to it because different identities of theirs um, uh, still connect with our mission. So it's, it's the team. It's the team and it's the passion and the commitment and um, that's what I would say led to the success. So you've helped, uh, helped how many people? Kids, adults? Well, that's hard to quantify. Um, I would say I'm in Lebanon direct service programs, um, uh, over 2,000. I would say in, in the dark programs here in the U.S., uh, over 1,500 or so. Um, and then I, th I would say through different workshops and other trainings, a few more thousand. I don't know. I mean, it's in the thousands. I don't know. I don't have the exact number. And a story you could maybe share with us? <sighs> um, I mean, there's a few. So one is in our, in, in our empowerment programs in Lebanon. Recently, I had a, a um, this... I'm not going to mention his name, but he reached out to me, and he's a Palestinian refugee in Lebanon. He's blind, and he went through our programs a few years, so he was a participant in our programs for years, and then he went to college, and he graduated, and he reached out to me. He's like, Sarah, I just want to let you know, because of ETI, I was able to really go to college, and I felt empowered, and I really was able to pursue my own dreams. Like, when he started off in our programs, he was, he had no hope in his life, in his future. He had no hope in anything, and, and now he's a volunteer in our programs, and I think that kind of uh, story and success is what really moves the work forward. Um, just seeing the kids 
learning how to use white canes. Here in the U.S. with our In the Dark programs, people that come out of it, actually last year a, a, a woman came up to me in London at a conference. She's like, are you Sarah from uh, Harvard Kennedy School? She's like, I attended your Dying in the Dark, and, and I found it so powerful now use it in Somalia and the government to bring different factions together and bring peace, peace across different factions in the government. So just kind of being able to create that impact on a global level and people are able to take that back to their own community is what really makes the difference. Where do you get asked to talk? This is such a, you know, needed topic and I'm assuming very, very popular. What kind of areas, like who, who, because you're always traveling. Yes. Um, um, yeah, I mean, different forums ranging from like we've, I've spoken at the World Government Summit and UNESCO and I'm a speaker for the State Department. So a lot of different conferences and summits and then universities like um, I sometimes give talks at conferences and universities and speeches there. So it's a wide range and I usually focus on either social entrepreneurship or disability or inclusion or empowerment or women leadership or, um, or as a Muslim and American. So a wide range of different aspects that really stem from my own identity or my own experience. And what, what do you hope in 10 years from now that you see yourself doing in your work I hope being in the position of? That ETI on one, I hope that ETI on one hand has really been able to shift the narrative just even, not, even if just a little bit um, in, in a lot of different sectors. And because to be honest, people that don't connect or relate to disability do not really care about the disability narrative. Like, if they think it doesn't really, um, um, really impact them, which is not true, because there's one billion individuals in this world with disability, one seventh of the, our world's population. I'm hoping that this change of narrative reaches people that would never have thought of disability, reaches influencers, reaches policymakers, reaches people, teachers, people that makes difference, uh, makes a, make, can make a difference in kids' life. So I'm hoping that we would have been able to shift the narrative just a bit. And on, on a personal individual level, I don't know. Um, I, where I see myself besides, I would hope to continue in this path of advocacy um, through ETI and through other engagements regarding disability inclusion. I, I mean, this is my passion, this is my calling, this is what I love. And I love also supporting people starting their own organizations, starting their own social enterprises and their own passion, their own commitment. So that's something I'm always passionate about. So I'm going to ask a very um, yes. hard question. Um, I can see, because I'm also Muslim, so the headscarf yes. is not something I'm unfamiliar. I'm, I'm very yes. familiar with it. So, but when you present yourself and your work and your organization, especially in the day and age of Islamophobia yes. and a lot of phobias, yes. um, how, do you find yourself sometimes being you know, discriminated or misunderstood, or your message is not coming across because people cannot get past the visual appearance that you are a Muslim? Um, it's so funny. So I think because I hold so many identities that can marginalize me, so I'm blind, I'm Muslim, visibly Muslim, I'm a woman, I'm um, Arab American, so all of those um, do marginalize me in many different ways. Um, I remember one time a professor at the Kennedy School, he was saying, Sarah, when you enter a room and you're so, you are aware of these isms surrounding your identity and you enter this room and you're kind of hesitant or careful or awkward, whatever it is, the people in the room are going to feel it and they're going to feed off of it and build on it. But when you enter a room and you believe that you, you uh, belong in this room, and you have something to offer, they're gonna see that strength and build off of it. So that's been a really great advice that I've been using in my whole life. And I think it's, a, it's an asset that I cannot see a mm -hmm. lot of times when I enter a room and there might be people looking at me and staring at me, but I can't tell. Right. Um, so I think that helps me being oblivious and I just enter a room, like, okay, let's talk. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, I think what, I, don't, I face less of a um, uh, um, uh, discrimination around my religion but more sometimes around my age so I can in my when I send out emails let's say to potential donors or investors or whatever you want to call it and I my email I mean saying that I'm from Harvard or Forbes of 30 under 30 whatever I look very kind of um, like it, it brings credibility then I enter a room I look really young I am a hijabi I am a blonde and then they're like oh this is who emailed us and right. I think sometimes they do there is that kind of oh 
this is who she is. And, um, but I think that shock also helps shatter some of these isms. It does. But on the other hand, if you're a white male entering a room like that, they never will think about your age or they'll never right. think about there's There's a lot of different aspects to my identity that sometimes shock. But like you said, I'm a few minutes in and I'm coming in confident and, and I believe what I have to offer, then they're going to take me seriously. So, yeah. So in 10 years, though, you said you wanted this to be what? What would you see yourself doing in 10 years? Would uh, you be doing this for the rest of your life? I mean, e ETI? Um, Yes, in whatever, in some capacity, definitely. I think I, I will always be part of ETI's journey, and I'm hoping ETI will continue to grow to be a known uh, international organization that is really breaking the narrative, not just in the U.S., but in other regions in the world. Um, so I, that is always going to be part of my journey. I, I do hope to do other also advocacy stuff, whether it's um, through other IGOs, whether it's through um, teaching and training. I do love to give workshops and training and, and giving speeches, whether it's through um, a political route, whatever it is, I do want it. But it's going to always be surrounding advocacy. It's always going to be surrounding um, uplifting marginalized voices. It's always going to be surrounding inclusion. So that's something that I'm passionate about. So you talked about that's what you want to do in the future, more yes. social activism. Yes. And you just finished talking about how you know, you're a Muslim woman yes. and visibly Muslim. Yes. Do you, in this kind of era where Muslims are misunderstood, yes. do you ever see yourself walking down that road where maybe you're tackling the misconceptions of Islam Definitely. and Muslims and especially women? Definitely, yes, definitely. That's something that, and I, I, I sometimes do that even now with different talks that I give. I always try, I do always try to bring that up, even with the in the dark sessions that we hold, that we host for companies and other entities. I bring that um, identity forward, and um, so that is something that I do, even if it's a side thing. But I do want to continue doing it. And so, how many centers do you have right now? Centers. We don't. So we don't have. Uh, so we have uh, two legal entity. So we have ETI US, which is the headquarter, and then we have ETI Lebanon, which is a separate legal entity, um, which is um, a hub for the MENA region, and then we're, we're in the future we'll be expanding to other regions in the world. Oh, okay. Yes. That's great. And how many people work in these uh, particular hubs? Um, so ETI US, we have um, five paid employees. Um, we have many other directors, and, I mean, many other volunteers. Um, I think around 30 plus volunteers in the US um, that are permanent, they're like staff. In Lebanon, we have, um, uh, I'm not sure how many paid, paid staff, but then we have around 120, 150 seasonal volunteers every year. So our team is really um, a lot dependent on our volunteers. Are our they interns. open? You talked about a whole other region, yes. right? In, in uh, like the Middle East. Yes. Are they open to people with disability and integrating them into their society? Is Lebanon open? Or is it different than what you will find in America? Oh, it's very different. I mean, it's the same in terms of the stigmas there. I mean, it's just more prominent over there. Like in Lebanon, blind people are not comfortable using a white cane in society because they don't want to be labeled as having a disability. They would rather be hidden or they would rather not go out. Or they would rather depend on others than using a white cane it's to that degree. Here, white cane is very much accepted and used. But then there's other subtle ways of discrimination and stigma. But over there, it's just much more evident. And then when you have a disability, and then you're also a refugee. For instance, we have a huge Syrian refugee population and Palestinian refugee population. You're a refugee. You have a disability. Um, and let's say you're a girl. You're triple marginalized. Your situation is so difficult. Um, there's no, almost like there's no hope. Um, so it's, it's so much, it's a different level. And it, I mean, it goes back to because I don't want to say there aren't communities that are better than others. It's just because of there's so many other, there's been war and conflict and all these different things that, you know, kind of perpetuate certain narratives. We only have a few minutes left, but in those two or three minutes, I, you mentioned that because you are blind yourself, this was kind of your motivation yes. that started this. Could you tell us a little bit about your story of exactly what was the the incident where you said, you know what, I need to do something about this. I'm going to change this, and I'm going to start working towards, you know, creating an organization and working towards helping other people. Yeah. What was that moment, and what led up to that moment? Yeah. I think there's a few, th few th things to it. First of all, over time growing up, I came to see my blindness as a blessing and something that I, 
I embrace and I love. And I think it's been a, such a blessing in my life. And coming to that point was really important. And the second thing, I mean, I never thought I would start ETIA. I mean, my undergrad was math and economics, and I was going to do a PhD. Um, but then I got this Clinton grant that allowed me, sophomore year in college, that allowed me to do the summer camp, which is the first of the first ever program that we ever ran and in Tripoli, Lebanon, and it was so successful. And seeing the impact on the kids and their parents and the community, I was like, wow, this is something I'm passionate about. But again, it, sophomore year in college, I was happy with the success, but I never thought it would continue. And then I was invited to the conference, to the CGIU conference a few times, and I saw their just fellow peers, students, just passionate and, and taking their commitment to another level. And I was like, wow, I can actually do something. Like, I don't have to stop here. And then, and second, and then my thesis advisor, who I will always think, Akhil Warapana, um, he was my thesis advisor on economics. And he, I was like, OK, I'm going to be applying to these PhD programs. He's like, Sarah, why are you applying to these PhD programs? Your eyes sparkle when you talk about your work that you did in Lebanon. Why not pursue that? What are you afraid of? I mean, of course, it's a big risk, but I took that risk, and I remember going home to my parents and like, okay, I'm starting a nonprofit organization, no more PhD, gonna take this, and, and then they take that. They're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I think until now they're like, what? <laughs> and I completely, and I think to be honest, being young, you're able to take more risks. Right. I didn't really have that much responsibility besides myself, and my parents were willing to support me. And then I ended up going to Harvard for my master's to learn more about how to really run a nonprofit and do programs that really can create impact. But I think just having people, like, the support. Again, it goes back to the support and believing in me and pushing me and saying, Sarah, this is your passion. Go for it. You can take that risk. So. Well, thank you for joining us today. Um, the fact that you represent Muslims globally, internationally, in universities and companies, uh, not just Muslim, but Muslim women and young Muslim women, uh, to show that you know we are educated, we do have our passions and our motivations and want to help the world. I'm so happy to know you and the fact Thank that you agreed you. to be on our show. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can I uh, mention the website? Oh, yes, please. Um, yeah, if anyone wants to check us out, it's etivision.org. So etivision, like vision of our eyes, vision.org. Um, if you can check us out, we're also on Facebook and uh, other social media. So to finish with my perspectives uh, for this show, I think it was pretty much well said on, you know, use your own abilities, use what, you know, you are capable of doing, turn that into a motivation and fly with it. And I think Sarah gave a great example of what she took as what other people might have considered a disability and turned it into a blessing. Thank you for joining us at Perspectives and I hope you join us again.